Hello everyone! Hi! Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I know that we saw a lot of you already talking in our um, chat boxes, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, and we're so excited that you're here. We're so excited that you've chosen to spend your evening with us. My name's Stephanie, and... I'm Claire. And, I mean, it's only appropriate that friends would do a Friends Forever event together. Um, so Claire and I are here to represent The Novel Neighbor. We're an independently owned and operated bookstore found in Webster Groves, Missouri. If you're not familiar with Missouri, you can also consider us from St. Louis. Uh, we are so excited for our friends this evening. I mean, truly, we've been looking forward to this launch day for a very long time. Claire has been helping us prep for it. Claire, you've been very excited for this newest book, right? Mm -hmm. As a longtime fan of the series. So I'm um, we won't take up too much more of your time outside of just a little bit of what will happen this evening. Um, you can order the book from us online if you haven't already. I'll throw a link up in the comments shortly, um, but it, we can be found at thenovelneighbor.com. We are going to do question and answers. So if you have some burning questions for Shannon and Lewin, we would love for you to put them in the comments throughout this. We will make sure that we get to those. Um, and finally, there is going to be a live drawing. So that will be super fun. We're in for an awesome way to spend the next hour. So without further ado, let's talk about who we're here for tonight. I held the book up, but we are here for Friends Forever's virtual uh, launch day today. Um, and we are so excited to have Shane and Hale and Lewin Pham joining us. They are best friends who have been publishing books for young readers for two decades. They have created three best-selling series together, the graphic novel, Friends series, the early chapter book, Princess in Black series, along with Dean Hale, and the picture book, Itty Bitty Kitty Corn. Shannon lives in Utah with her husband, four kids, and two cats, where she writes award-winning novels like The Goose Girl, Book of a Thousand Days, Dangerous, and the Newbery Honor winner, Princess Academy, and pens other books with her husband, Dean, including Diana, Princess of the Amazons, illustrated by Victoria Ying, Rapunzel's Revenge, illustrated by Nathan Hale, and two novels about Marvel's unbeatable Squirrel Girl. Lewin lives in Los Angeles with her husband, two sons, a cat, and an orange gecko. She is the author and illustrator of the books Big Sister, Little Sister, A Piece of Cake, The Itchy Book, and Outside Inside. She is also the illustrator of over 100 books for kids, including Vampirina Ballerina by Anne-Marie Pace, Grace for President by Kelly DiPuccio, and The Boy Who Loved Math by Deborah Heigelman. Her illustrations have won numerous awards, including the prestigious Caldecott Honor for Bear Came Along with Richard Morris. Shannon and Leigh Wynn plan to keep making books together for many years to come and to stay friends forever, which is good news for us all. So please join us in welcoming Shannon and Leigh Wynn this evening. Yay! Yay! Hello! <laughs> Happy <laughs> launch day! Hey, wherever you're joining us from. So nice to see you guys. I wish we could actually see you guys. That's what I, I don't like about this. I wish you were there in person. Your faces. So I'm in Utah and Lewin is... I'm in California. Yeah. Oh, wait. What? 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 <laughs> oh. <laughs> she took us away. <laughs> Even though this is a virtual tour, we yeah. just had to be together. So Wynn's staying with me this week, and I'm staying with her next week. I just, I couldn't possibly let this moment slide by. I'm like, hey, we're both vaccinated. I'm going to come see you. Even if the bookstores can't see us, I'm going to come see you. So you get the two of us in one camera. Look how nice that is. <laughs> it is so much nicer, and it makes it me nicer. happy. And I missed her so much. It's been two years, so... Let's Thanks to the this. Novel Neighbor for having <laughs> us. We're really fond of St. Louis. We were on tour there yeah. for Best Friends when we came up with the idea for Itty Bitty King. I know. We've had some amazing ideas together in your yeah. fair city. So we're, we're like a little extra gra grateful for you yes. guys for seeing the lovely people you are. I keep looking in the wrong place. Shannon knows what she's doing, and she's like right in the camera. And I keep looking down. I know. she's. So I made this sign, and I put it right next to the camera like, hole. And it's not working for me because I just keep looking down. Well, whatever. Anyway, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I made it, <laughs> and now uh, we're here to talk about friends forever. Let's take it away. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and play this, um, this share this PowerPoint. Yeah, those are the words I'm trying to say. So we have this is the third and final book in this series, and you don't have to read them in order. But if you want to read them all, it would make sense to read them in order. And Real Friends is the first book. 
Real Friends, these are all memoirs or true stories about me growing up. And this is me in fourth grade. And this is me in fifth grade, the main ages that I was in friends, in real friends. I was a really anxious kid. I didn't want to leave my mom and start school. Uh, but when I made a best friend, I felt like everything was going to be okay. But the older I got, the more complicated friendship became. My best friend was popular and she could join the group, the, this group of cool girls in our grade. But I wasn't sure if I was popular enough to join the group. So I was kind of half in, half out. I was also dealing with a big sister who was pretty rough on me. And it felt like sharing a house with a grizzly bear sometimes. Mm -hmm. My mom would tell me things like, sticks and stones may, hurt, uh, may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And that was confusing to me because words really did hurt me, as Wynne shows beautifully in this illustration. In Best Friends, which took place in sixth grade, that's me in sixth grade yeah, you do. <laughs> with my 80s hair. I was best friends with the hands down the coolest, most popular girl in our entire school. And I felt like a princess and everything was going to go great. But it didn't always go great. I was confused about like what was cool, what was not. I was also writing a book at this time and when beautifully illustrates passages from the novel that I was writing. And writing was a way to deal with my anxiety. I had an undiagnosed anxiety disorder. I didn't understand why I felt the way I felt and what was going on. But you, I love graphic novels that you can see, you can read, but you can also just see and feel how it felt to feel that way in images like this. I didn't think my friends were the right friends for me, but I was afraid to move away from them because I was going to be starting junior high and the idea of starting junior high without any friends felt like this, a roller coaster with no track. Friends Forever starts back in, in junior high. It's actually eighth grade now. There I am in eighth grade <laughs> with my nice attempt at 80s hair. Nice I perm. tried to perm it <laughs> and it just, my hair did not take the perm. So you was supposed to be these big corkscrew curls, you know, big fluffy hair instead. It's just like this fried haystack. I did have friends in junior high. I had good friends. I had pretty great friends, but I didn't feel great all the time. And I, and I couldn't figure out why I didn't feel great all the time. A lot of it was just the pressures of being 13. There's so many more pressures in school, with friends, with family, all the things that I wanted to accomplish. I got braces. I tried to get a perm, which was disastrous. I tried to do so many things and do so many things well. Here's one little story from the book. When I was in eighth grade, once a month, our school would have a student of the month, and their teachers would nominate these students of the month. And my teacher nominated me and a bunch of other girls. And these other girls seemed way more accomplished than me. I was sure I was not going to win. But we were all brought in to have an interview with a panel of teachers. And when I went in, I started to tell them about, I didn't feel like I really had that much to show for myself. Like, what have I accomplished? But when I told them about how I was a writer and I was writing a novel, the, teach, the main teacher was like really impressed with it. And I thought, well, maybe I do have a chance. And then later at the assembly where they announced the winner, they said my name. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the biggest thing that had ever happened to me. I was invited up on stage with the other, with the boy who was the other student of the month. And we were standing up there with our plaques and feeling like amazing. And then the teacher started telling us that she had called our parents for amusing anecdotes uh. about us. Like, are there any parents listening? <laughs> Can I talk to you about what qualifies as an amusing anecdote about your middle schooler? Because it was not the ones that my father chose. <laughs> First, he told a story about how when they were camp, we were hiking one time, and I was th two or three, and I just started to cry and cry and cry. And they thought, "Why is she crying? She's ruining the hike." And then finally, they realized that I had a knee full of cactus needles, and they hadn't noticed. I'm, I'm like, oh, "Why is he telling that story? It's so boring." And then the second story he told about me was that the other day I came home from school and I was crying, and my dad said, "What's the matter?" And I said, "I got a B plus on my test." And first of all, for the record, I don't even want to say this here, but 
I wasn't crying. <laughs> I was disappointed because I thought I had done better and I was disappointed and I was glum that I got a B plus when I thought I had gotten an A. <laughs> but also both of the stories he told about me were me crying, mm -hmm. which was just awesome to be up on this stage while he's telling that. And then she starts telling the story that, that Timmy's mom had told about her, about him. And his story was even worse to tell in a middle school in 1987 because the mom, Timmy's mom had told a story about how one time he was lost in a grocery store. And when he went to ask for help and they asked his name and he said, Timmy, they thought he said, Tammy, because with his beautiful blonde hair, they thought he was a girl. So they announced, well, Tammy's mother, please come pick up their daughter. <laughs> how do you think that went over with the boys in 1987 middle school? Not great. So there's me and Timmy standing up on this stage as the students are booing us and laughing at us. Ugh. This is how it felt. Look at that image. Ugh. It was supposed to be our biggest, proudest moment. And instead it felt like that. That's a hard image to draw because I know everyone sort of knows how that feels to have yeah. people, sort of faceless people laughing at you in the audience and the ha 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 is just too overwhelming. It's crazy. It is, it is crazy. And I have to say, I had such mixed feelings about that whole experience. I brought home that plaque and I wanted to be proud of it. And I also just felt terrible. Mm -hmm. Like there was just no moments where everything was okay. Like even the moments that were supposed to feel good, I felt bad and I felt bad for feeling bad. But again, I had that undiagnosed anxiety disorder and, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And as things got harder with middle school, with friends, with all kinds of challenges, I started to get into a depression and I didn't realize what was going on. I didn't have anyone to talk to about it, or at least I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know how to say what was going on. I didn't have the words for it. Back then we didn't talk about mental health at all. And I'm really glad we're talking about it more and taking the stigma out because mental health is just health. We don't have to be ashamed for having asthma. We don't have to be ashamed for just as the way our, our bodies work and the way we are born. And we don't have to be ashamed for anxiety or depression. These things, these things happen. Fred's Forever has a lot of, you know, serious topics and big moments. But one of our favorite things about Friends Forever is it is. <laughs> We were trying to figure out how we were going to do this transition easily, and I think I might have messed it up here, but okay. 80s was a big deal. Shannon and I are the same age. We were both 13 at the same time, around the same year. We knew all the popular movies that came out during that time, which if you guys can't see, Cisco Lost Ghost Boys and Ghostbusters and Karate Kid, although I think by the time we were there, it was like Ghost Credit Kick 3. Stand by me. Oh my god, River Phoenix was my most loved. And for those of you guys out there who recognize this, extra bonus points to you. Morgan, our publicist, is going to never live down the fact that she doesn't recognize what this is. But does anybody know what this is? It's the Goonies. Chester Cotter! Chester Cotter! Chester Cotter! You guys aren't going to read the book anymore because we're being stupid, aren't you? But we can't help it. I love the Goonies. It was like my favorite movie. To this day, the movie I've seen the most in the theater. Oh, memorized it. Sean Astin sent me a birthday special, birthday wish thing before. We'll show that off some other time. But anyway, we're all about the 80s. <laughs> Which we weren't actually cool in the 80s, so we're kind of reliving our 80s moments. I have also. very straight hair. And yeah. as you saw, I tried to get that perm to get the big hair. And it just didn't work. And big hair was what was beautiful. And you did like you did a teasing thing with your hair. I yeah. can't do it anymore. My hair's too thin. But like, my hair's too silky. Yeah, I guess. That's how we it's say it. too silky and it won't it won't tease. Do you guys have any idea what teased hair does? You take this supersonic, crazy, like astronaut-like stuff called Aquanet. It's hairspray for elephants. And <laughs> you spray it on, and before it turns rock hard, which is pretty quick. You got to take a brush and, and make your hair just fuzz on your forehead. Like the higher up it goes, the better it looks. And then you spray it again on one, one last dose. And then it just stays there. And you got to pray that the wind doesn't blow in your face. Because when it does, it just 
plucks up over the side of your face. We, we might be doing that in school tomorrow. We'll see how that I'm goes. I'm trying but. to see if we have a picture of you <laughs> with really big hair. It's not super big, but you can see. Oh, yeah. See, see there's Wynn in the 1980s. She does have the low the, dose. The bigger. Yeah. It's a little bit. In my tasty. neighborhood, especially in my high school, it was popular for a lot of the girls not only to have big hair, but to have like a wall of bangs. Yeah. So the straight bangs would up. go straight up like this, but then they would have a little claw like that. It was literally <laughs> like that. It was just a wall like this at the top of their head. Sprayed tight. I was jealous. Like I, I wished I could have done that with my hair. But you know what? You don't have to be jealous, Shannon, because you know why? Why? When? We have an artist right here. Is it you? It's me. I yeah. think it's me. And I think we also have a volunteer named do Claire. We have a volunteer. Where did Claire go? We're it's dragging her back on the screen. Come on, it's Claire. our volunteer. We are going to use my lovely sketchbook and we are going to turn Claire into a total 80s girl. Are you ready for this, Claire? Mm -hmm. Claire, come on, Claire. Let's do this. I, right. I want to show some, uh, <laughs> some 80s real style yeah. so here's madonna in in the yeah. 80s desperately seeking susan you can see the bigger bangs the big hair there get into the groove girl you got to prove oh no boy you're you not to me <laughs> cindy lopper oh. who sang the theme song for the goonies just so you guys oh, all yeah. know look Good at man. what you're missing from the 80s for you look at that look how great she is i can never figure out how to do it Good now. I can't believe Call that we're doing this. All right, good, good. So, Claire, you're going to have to move more into the center of the screen. I'm going to do some of my movie magic with you. I'm going to be drawing off to the side like a crazy person over here with my 80s stuff. Claire, you're going to get like major hair and you're going to get the 80s do, okay? And while I am doing this, yeah. I think Shannon's going to be answering some right. questions. Right, questions, questions. So, send your questions in the little chat. Claire, don't move. Here we go. <laughs> Claire will not move, but Shannon, I will ask you some questions. Um, first, I want to highlight some feedback that we're getting in the chat because there is certainly um, a lot of excitement. And so, first of all, your Goonies references was not lost. You did not lose people during during that time period. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Lots of love from the Goobies coming in from multiple people. We have Alyssa giving the Goonies some love, Sarah Ooh. giving the Goonies some love, uh, Michelle giving the Goonies some I mean, so truly, oh, sorry. Put my hand in front of Claire's face. That's not helpful to a layman. Um, so first thing that I want to address, um, because I think this was breaking news for some people. Um, Shannon, can you help the hearts that we broke today by announcing that this is the final in the series? Oh. <laughs> I didn't anticipate it no. breaking hearts. We've known for so long it was gonna be the last we one. We got all chipper for you and now all of a sudden I we know. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me play a mournful note on my harmonica. <laughs> Wow, she came prepared. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the last one. Um, and the main reason why is it's too freaking hard. <laughs> <laughs> These books kill us, both of us. They're so demanding. They're demanding in time. They're demanding in emotional energy. And we we need to save our little hearts. <laughs> from the it's tough because Shannon, I mean, I keep saying this, but I don't think you guys get it. When she writes these books, she's doing this. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> and she's hoping you guys are going to love what she puts out there, which is solidly her heart. Yes. And as the books progress, they become harder for me to draw because I become closer and closer with Shannon and I get more nervous and scared for her. And it's hard to draw like some of the pain that your best friend is going through and you, you don't want to draw her in her throes of depression or anxiety or sadness. It's and I think hard. it's tough. It's, it's but also there's not a, a really strong story for what would come next. In my mind, there's not. I, I'm not, I don't, it's not like I'm thinking, oh, if only I had a chance to write about my freshman year of high school. Um, it's just not calling to me the way the other ones were. So this feels like a really good place to stop. That being said, Shannon tends to think up new stories as her kids age up. So who knows, when Maggie gets older, 
it might just turn out that you know your daughter's going to inspire you to new depths of. But would it be wondering. weird to have a series start with real friends that starts with me in kindergarten and ends with me in like, you know, midlife crisis? <laughs> We're not going that far. Okay. We're Middle aged far. friends, we're not yeah. going to do. No. Okay. I don't know. It might be cathartic for some people. Some of us might need that story. <laughs> I, we were talking with somebody on the radio today that was like, we need more stories about adult women that are just friends, just women uh, being friends with each other. And I was like, yeah. That would be nice. Instead of tearing each other apart yeah. and fighting over the man. <gasps> Look at Claire. There she is. <laughs> Look at that. As an 80s girl with your There's own girl. <laughs> <laughs> what do you oh, think? I like it. <laughs> I love it. I wish I had neon colors with me because then I could draw in all the neon. Just imagine, you know, the pink all over there. Do we have somebody else we could do? Are we capable of that? Oh, I wish someone could like send in their picture. Ooh. Well, maybe we better do Stephanie. <gasps> Steph, you want to turn into an 80s girl? Can I Cindy Lopperize you? Cindy. Oh my gosh, please. Yeah. Right. I love Cindy. I would love to be Cindy Lopperize. Yeah. Uh, or you have her in your head. No, I can look at it because I'm sure Cindy Lopper is constantly inspiring. Well, okay. and, and, and Cindy Lopper is constantly reinventing herself. So it's not like we can pin down exactly who Cindy Lopper is. <laughs> this is very true. Girls just want to have fun, Cindy Lopper. Is that eight that's eighties, right? It's yes, very that's very 80s. Time yeah. after time. Oh. I got nervous when I said it out loud. I was like, that's solidly 80s, right? Like, <laughs> Man, Cindy You weren't Lopper. born in the 80s, were you? None of you were. Oh, my gosh. I was born in 92. He was the best. What decade were you born? Uh, 2010. All right. We got all different. We all all different. Oh, well, my youngest two two kids were born in 2010. Mine, my. So you could be one of mine. You could be the triplet. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 2010 was a good year. It was the year of the tiger, wasn't it? It was year of the tiger. I think year of the tiger. 74 was 2010. Year of the tiger again. I think it was year of the tiger. Oh, yeah, okay. year of the tiger. It's a good year. That's a fun one. I of the tiger. Look it's at the dream me. of the fight. Rising up. To the arrivals, and the next known survivor watched his prey in the night, and he watching the tiger survive. Oh, the tiger! No, the eye of the tiger. Okay. Shout out to band kids. You know that there's a lot of band kids who are watching this with us, who know how to play that on various instruments because of football games we were at. Oh. Or Excellent. Excellent. Actually, the guys, do you guys who read out there, did you guys get the inference for the ZZ Top video that's mm. in the book? I don't know if they've had a chance to read it. It came out today. Oh my gosh, that's right. Well, that's okay. It doesn't spoil anything. ZZ Top, do you guys know who ZZ Top, that old video from the 80s? Claire was like, no. There was a music video for She's Got Legs. She's got It was like a makeover thing, which was like one of my favorite dream sequences in my head. So there is a fantasy sequence in the book that's Definitely straight out of ZZ Top. Yes, this mousy girl gets all made up and she's made to look all beautiful. That was my that was my daydream. Yeah, and ZZ. I don't know what ZZ Top had to do with that, but it was their music video. Yeah, I know, but I still don't understand what they had to do with <laughs> making them up. Anyway, what else? Do we have other questions? Yeah, yeah we got lots of questions coming <laughs> through. Um, I do want to address a question really quickly, and you can also maybe speak to this. But we do have signed book plates, which someone I believe is asking. So if you order from us, we do have signed book plates that we will include. Um, some people, I do believe we're sold out of them by, by this point, but we had a pre-order special for the awesome magnets that y'all made um, that also are coming. So I saw some people asking in the comments about that and just wanted to address that really quickly. Um, I... This is a question that's coming through. Um, when you moved to junior high, did you ever see Zara and Veronica again? Oh, oh yeah. Those, yeah. Those were fun characters. I did, yeah. I, I did. And they were older than me. So um, they, it was a very weird thing when I was growing up that you really didn't interact with people who were not in your grade. So um, they were always kind to me, though. So we didn't hang out as much in junior high, but they were, and we weren't in the same classes because we were in different grades. They were always nice to me. And Zara, that's not her real name, but um, she was, again, we were in high school together. And then in high school, it was easier to be friends with people in different grades and we became good friends again. And I, I just, to this day, I adore them both. And I just feel so grateful that they were in my life at just the right time. 
Yeah, those are good friends to have. I should have asked you about that. I'm gonna yeah. meet them someday. Tell I have their people. names in my brain. I almost want to always say them out loud because their real names are like really beautiful too. Um, so that's why I give them beautiful made up names because they have beautiful real names. I love that. Thank you so for such a great question. I believe that was coming from Grant. Um, do you want to ask that question? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a question from an eight-year-old fan. This one was based on your life, but how do you come up with the ideas for your other stories? What is funny um, is that writing the true stories that are based on my life are harder for me than making stuff up. And that, that may seem counterintuitive, but when I was younger, I always wanted to be a writer, but I was worried I wouldn't have enough ideas. And then as I got older, just by living longer and reading lots of books and being in the world, it's gotten to the point where I have so many ideas. I have more ideas than I could ever possibly use. So ideas are no longer hard for me. And when I write memoir, um, like I'm writing a book right now that I've, I've gotten to like the fifth draft and my editor read it and she's like, it's just, it's still not just working. And so I look at it and I go, okay, I'm just gonna change the main character and I'm gonna change what happens and this is gonna happen instead. So I can do that when I make stuff up. When I'm writing memoir, I can't just make stuff up. <laughs> so if somebody's not working, I can't just change the main character or create a new scene. I can only write what actually happened. So I have to be way more creative in figuring out how to make a story flow and communicate uh, with while only telling what actually happened. I always like to tell a funny story too. Um, my son on the very first book in Real Friends, you guys all remember, there's a scene where Shannon um, rejects Jenny. Do you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. um, Jenny comes and wants to be a member of the group and Shannon says, mm, no, and walks away. <laughs> And my son, I remember he was the same age at the time when he wrote the book, and he, he looked at me and he was like, oh, Mama, what is she so mean to her at this point? Why can't you just change it in the story? Just change it. And I had to look at him like, that's not what a memoir is, honey. <laughs> that's just, you don't do that. You can't change the story. That's what I did. So that's what I had that's to write. That's what you did, exactly. I could have, when I'm writing a memoir, I can tell what I, ha what I did or I can omit what I did, but I can't make up new things that I did. <laughs> <laughs> So speaking kind of on that same line, and you share with us in your presentation how this is, well, we've talked about how this is really difficult to write from real experiences in a time that was uh, was difficult in a lot of different ways. I did writing this, do you find writing helps process emotions? Like what would you say for someone who also might be experiencing some similar things as far as like as a creative outlet been helpful for you? I would say, first of all, sometimes I don't know how I feel until I've written it down. So I would say, keep a journal. A journal is amazing. I now keep my journal on a computer because I can type so much faster than I can write and I'm just more comfortable on a computer. So I just have a file on my computer where I journal. And sometimes as I'm writing in the journal and I'm just talking about how I feel and what I think, and I'm like, oh, that's what, how I feel, what I think. Until I wrote it down, I didn't realize it. So, you know, writing stuff down is a great way to kind of understand yourself better and understand. Something else, too, about the eighth grade year that's kind of cool that Chenna did amazingly well, she's like a little, a little archaeologist. She kept artifacts of her life forever. This is a shoebox full of notes that she used to pass around with her eighth grade friends, their real notes. How insane is that? We used to fold them like this in like a little, a little <laughs> triangle shape. I don't, I, I'm afraid to take it apart because I can't remember how to so put it back old together. And you don't want to damage it, but wow. This was really, this was really helpful when I was writing uh, the books. I could go back and read all the things my friends, this was all just eighth grade. And that's one reason why I did eighth grade as the third book because I had so much contemporary evidence of what yeah. I what we were was important to us what we were thinking about and even just dialogue yeah and the and some of the notes they're, they're like I want to say they're dramatic but they're not they're what kids actually feel at the time yeah you know when you get like it's I'm telling earnest. you Claire you get older and you get a lot more careful about what it is you want to write down and so you, you sort of hold yourself back God, when you're like in eighth grade you don't hold anything back so it's like so a shoebox of really honest feelings and emotions and so much so that it's almost painful to read some of these notes because it's just it's just so bare and naked and oh. I guess it was interesting too about when I was reading through them 
like so many of the notes written to me from girls were, were saying, oh, I'm so ugly. I feel ugly today. Oh, I hate myself. I don't feel good. I don't think anybody likes me. And like I had a, a, one of my best friends was a boy and every single note from him was like, talk to that girl, tell her how cool I am. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and ah! There was never a moment of, of like him talking himself down no. where that's, it was him just freely asking for favors all the time. And the girls were always feeling bad about themselves. And, and something I actually get into quite a bit in Friends Forever is the idea of what it felt like to be a girl and what confusing messages girls receive from the culture. Um, and so many of the messages that we received are, you should feel bad about yourself all the time. Mm. And I did. And I did feel bad about myself all the time. And I think we are better than we were then. Um, we're better now. Yeah. But we're still not great. We're not great, but you guys live in a much better time, I gotta say. Yeah. I feel like things are looking up and you know, I, I feel like girls aren't necessarily all about the way they look anymore. Yeah. And my That's son sad. has been asking me, how do I talk to my friends about how they feel about things? And I think that is cool yeah, and extraordinary great and it means that that's very healthy divisions are breaking down and yeah you guys you guys are going in the right direction <gasps> yeah <gasps> what do i look like oh my <laughs> gosh <I'm upset. laughs> I can oh, I'm <laughs> for you is good enough for me is good enough it's good enough for me. This is my favorite part. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We didn't advertise this as a musical. No, that was our mistake because <laughs> yes. let's go. Who knew? Give me more. Give me more. What else do I draw? This is why we need to be in a store because we run out of people I know. To draw. Can we, is there any way to bring someone else up that she can draw someone else while we keep talking? Anyone else? Is there anyone bring else? Bring up. <laughs> <laughs> We should embarrass our publicist for not oh, knowing good and and bring her up. Oh no. Oh, okay. we're, we're gonna give her just one second. I see so we're gonna give her, but she's coming. She's here. And that's just what is fun about this. Yay! <laughs> what are we gonna do, oh, guys? I'm so excited. <laughs> we should turn into Duran Duran, into Wham, into Boy George. We're gonna turn you into Boy George. Do you guys know who Boy George is? I do. Do you know who Boy George is? Boy George, man, he, I love the hair. He was come, 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 and go. come, come, and go. Okay, we don't know the rest. But we're going to turn you into Boy George. Can I do that? Love be easy if your colors are like, like my dreams. dreams. Red, gold, and dream. No. Red, gold, and green. In broken dreams. No, red, gold, oh, and green. Okay. okay, you guys got us. We don't know what we're saying. <laughs> I, know. I think you put on a phenomenal <laughs> uh, It's a concert. No one knew this was going to be a concert. I'm oh, sorry. I know. We should have built it that way because you're probably really impressed with our singing. Yes, I am. And mm -hmm. our lyric recall. Yes. You wouldn't walk away from this thinking this is a very difficult book. You think it's a musical. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you guys continue with the questions. I'm going to start going. Yeah, questions. questions. Uh, do you want to ask Alyssa's question? Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay. So Alyssa said, which one of the three was the hardest to rate? Uh, this one. The Friends Forever was. Yeah. The first one was challenging in that it was the, I didn't know what I was doing. I never written a memoir before. And uh, it was only the third graphic novel I'd ever written as well. Um, and graphic novel is a very challenging format regardless. And then memoir is a very challenging format. And so doing both together, um, I really leaned on our editor, Connie, who's very much part of our super trio. And she's her pictures in the back of uh, Best, Best Friends. Um, She's a big part of this she process. She cameos in actually all three books. We'll put her in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's on the bus there. with yeah, us. Yeah. Oh, is at the very end of Best Friends. Yeah. Uh, a little Easter egg. There is uh, adult Win and adult Connie and adult uh, me are yeah. on the bus together. Yeah, we're all there together. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find it. Well, anyway. Um, but so, yeah. yeah, so that was tricky just to figure out what, what I was doing and trying to find the courage to do it. Because writing a memoir, like writing anything is hard. It never gets easy. I mean, there are fun parts and I really do enjoy a lot of the process of writing, 
but there's always self-doubt and confusion and lost parts. But with a memoir, in addition to all that, there's a little voice in my head all the time saying, shut up, Shannon, no one cares that people were mean to you when you were 10. And it's really hard to turn off that voice. Um, and I never succeed in turning it off. I just keep writing through it. But, um, and you know, the second one was challenging as well. But the third one, boy, it just knocked the wind out of me. It was tough. It was really tough in every way. It was tough emotionally. It was tough figuring out what story to tell and how to tell it. It was a challenging book. And, um, you know, as we're talking about it being the last one, uh, it is not, it, and I, we said it was because it, they're hard to do, which is true. But they're also, for me, the most rewarding books I've ever published. Like the reactions that I get and how I feel about that they're out in the world, like, they're worth my whole writing career that they exist. So yeah. I, you know, even though they're hard, there's like no regret there at all. I think the third one is actually the hardest for me to illustrate too. Was it? Yeah, because- Best Friends was really hard. Actually, Real Friends. Oh, it was Real Friends was really the toughest. Hard. Cause during Real Friends, um, my mother was sick and there was a lot going on in my private life. And it was, it was, it was a tough year to kind of go through. And there's the scene in Real Friends um, where Shen's being yelled at by her sister. And if you guys remember that scene, it's in the bedroom and we get really close to her face and she's just being screamed at. And at some point the words become almost like objects and they're just battering Shannon down. And, and I'm having to zoom in closer and closer and closer to her face. And I remember just crying through, you guys are getting all the backstory. I was just <laughs> crying through that whole thing because it's it was hard. I think I was doing it at two in the morning because I was on a ride to connect with Shannon. And um, that one was just, I don't know, that one just really, really killed me to do. But the second one wasn't as tough for me, I think because I really understood you and yeah. I felt like I had a good grip on the story and Shannon does better in the second story. This one is a, a really difficult one. And for those of you guys who haven't read it yet, um, you might start to notice uh, that she starts to move into sort of a depression. And how do you communicate that in, in pictures? And the only way I could do it was, if you, if you guys notice it, it, it starts to get a little less saturated, the colors start to go down and become sort of monotone, you know, just a few colors. Um, the frames of the, of the images start to get all jaggy when she gets less stable. And she goes through something that I personally haven't experienced. And I think that was that was tough for me to do, not because I was experiencing it, but because I knew at this point, Shannon and I were so close. Like, I always joke that we share a brain, but at this point we were like sharing a heart. And to draw her, in that kind of pain and I, and I understand the grown-up Shannon you know the cool Shannon you've got here like I also know all the difficulties that she has with herself and um, what she went through as a kid and to put all of that onto the page was I don't know it was, it was just it was a tough part this, this last book is there's a lot of the both of us as kids and the both of us as adults mm -hmm. yeah you know what's interesting I never told you before but that scene from Real Friends where my sister's yelling at me um, there are certain things that happened in my childhood that I would retell as stories to people as I grew up. And sometimes I would try to tell that story to people and I could tell I never told it right. Like I could never really communicate why that moment was like one of the lowest of my life. And the, it, it, what's really behind it was someone hates you so much. Someone who should love you and protect you hates you and you believe their hate and you internalize their hate and it's a low low moment that i can never explain until you illustrated it and then people can see it and then they can feel it it's one of those moments i could never tell in words it was for pictures i'm really good at trying hate <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's tough these yeah. books you know if you guys are out there and you're thinking i want to do a book like this you gotta do it with your best friend. You gotta do it with someone that you really, really trust. Trust, and uh, you gotta hope that person's gonna take care of you both ways. And it, it, it kind of yeah. goes both ways. And it's, it's tough for that. It's, oh, we're gonna get all emotional here. We should be doing that. I'm drawing but my it's door. Also, <laughs> good enough for <laughs> you is good enough for me. It's good enough. You have to watch the video because we're doing a very spectacular yeah, imitation. Yeah. And then you she kind of no like, oh, yes. No idea. All right. I need one more question to finish this drawing. So. You're spot on. Oh, we have questions for days. Don't you worry. Oh, we have okay. 
Lots of them. I am. Um, a positive, a, a question that is like very exciting, um, I'm sure to relive is Amelie is wondering how it feels to have a book published. And maybe even we can go back to like a memory you might have with like your first book being published, but any memory is totally fine. Amelie has, it feel have such a beautiful name. Yeah, I love that. That's <laughs> my question. That's my favorite name in the world. <laughs> um, uh, there's nothing that compares to having your first book published except like birthing a baby, I think. I don't think winning a lottery would have felt like a bigger deal to me than having my first book published. My first book was a novel that I worked on for many years and was rejected again and again and again. So even just getting the news that someone wanted to publish it was, it was incredible. And I made very, very little money on it. Um, like if you add up the number of hours I worked on it, it would be less than one cent an hour is what I made on it. And it didn't matter because I was something I poured years into, um, I was getting to share. And that was, it was really special. It was really beautiful. And every book coming out, it, it does feel, it, uh, back to the 80s, um, back to the future. Like some people may say, like the best part of that movie is when they go back to the past or back to the future or whatever. The best part of that movie for any writer is when the dad opens up his box of, and he's got his new books or I've just been, and every writer's like, oh, I don't want to go back to the future. I don't want a DeLorean. I don't want a nuclear <laughs> physicist's best friend. I want that box of books. <laughs> I never thought about that, but that's really, that's probably really true. Yeah. <laughs> Are you done? I'm done. Can okay, I show? Ready? Boy Morgan! <laughs> oh my god, I love it when. Oh my goodness, I love it. It's going to you. And next oh my goodness, gonna... I can't wait. I'm going to send you a mailing label for that after this. Don't you do that. <laughs> <laughs> How are you hold? You're the, the queen of the mailing universe. <laughs> Thank you, Wen. I'm honored to be drawn. We're being very silly and chatty, and 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 I don't know. We, should we should we answer the questions oh, faster yeah. oh, so we can get yeah. through them more? Or there are um, a lot of books. Oh, yeah. oh goodness. We um, have yes. Let's um, make sure that we get, we have lots of good questions. So, okay, well, we'll try um, to answer faster so we're not yeah. forgetting any. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we don't leave anything on the cutting room floor. Yeah, that's yeah. good. I am, do you wanna ask Kelly's question? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Kelly said, how do you write books even when you're apart? Even when you're what? When you're apart. Oh, well, how, oh, when we, how do we do it? Um, so most of the time when there's illustrated books, uh, whether that's a picture book like Itty Bitty Kitty Corn mm -hmm. or a chapter book like Princess in Black that we do together or a graphic novel, um, the writer does the writing first and you know, do the writing and the revisions, work with the editor and get it polished before the artist ever comes on. Yeah, most of the time. And Shannon's case, um, it might be a little bit different in our case. Uh, for the graphic novel, Shannon, uh, for this book particularly, Shannon worked with me for, I don't know how long you guys worked on this book together, but it felt like it was a really long time. This, of all the three books actually, I feel like it's the one book that I didn't get as much um, early uh, access to. Yeah. The, the first two books I got to see a lot. Like early earlier lot. drafts of yeah. the script. And, but this one, I think um, Connie's, uh, our editor, is really good. He's had a credit for making sure that this, uh, that Shannon's getting the story out. Um, but usually when I get the manuscript, if I've got questions or if I'm, I'm concerned about something, I'll send off the sketches to Shannon and Connie, and they both get to take a look at it. They both get to sort of give you notes. It goes a little bit back and forth in that way. Um, Princess in Black, not so much. Princess in Black, it's gotten to the point where they just send it off, and I just like have. She fun just does with whatever it. she wants, and <laughs> nobody says. <"Pee." laughs> because first of all, why would we? She's brilliant, and second of all, those books are so much work for her. She does like eighty-five watercolor paintings oh, for a single book. <laughs> I just if you do not get enough credit for what you do in those books. No, those are those are just. So much fun. And I always tell this to Shannon and Dean when I see them. It's like, if you've got a really good dance partner, you have to step up your own game. So every single time I get a script from them, it's like, oh my God, it's already so funny. How do I make the <laughs> illustrations work? And you do that. That, that crap and the new one kills well, me. I get the last chance at it, so that's, that's pretty cool. But I know that for Itty Bitty Kitty Corn, um, we don't like to write those apart. We like to be together when yeah. we do it. Uh, and I think it's just because we have so much fun. We were just working on number three. Yeah, we're and looking at it over like, this one's good. Yeah. We, we got this one in the can. But you know what? We work very differently in all the three different series yeah. that we do. So Princess in Black, 
what the what you see on the page is all there is in the script. There's no art notes. We don't give her art notes. Mm -hmm. We just write that and then she does whatever she wants. With with a graphic novel, I mean, there's way more art notes than there is words that you see on the page. Yeah. It's, you know, at least five times the script is five times longer than what you would see. And that's because you have to describe what's happening every panel. Um, so it's like a, it's like a screenplay. Yeah, it's it's a lot tougher, and then you have to like I have to make sure did I communicate what she wanted me to communicate because they each connect. Each panel is like one sentence that connects to another, and if you miss that one sentence, it doesn't work right. We were just yeah. talking about that. How if a graphic novel, if you look at a panel and you can't figure out what's going on, it's really hard to connect it with what happened before to what happens afterwards. So it's really tricky. It's tricky to write. It's tricky to illustrate. Um, and if you if you're doing both well, then it's very easy to read. But I'm sure you guys have all read those graphic novels where you're like, wait, what just happened? Yeah, you have to yeah. go back a few pages and you go back and forth. We don't want to do that. We're always trying to make sure that you guys can flow right through and not You're be so, up. so good at that. You're all about telling the story and communicating the feeling. Oh, you're and so good at writing these stories. Well. <laughs> all right. We were supposed to answer shorter. Sorry. Next. Next. <laughs> Uh, Jules is wondering, do any of your friends in the book know about your book? Do you still talk to any of them? I had decided when I started Real Friends that I would not reveal information about the people in the book besides me, except for what's in the book. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not to say that any that the information would be good or bad, but I just uh, I want to be protective of their privacy. But I but I can say in general. Um, none of the people that I was friends with in any of those three books are still my close friends. I really made my friends for life starting in high school. And I think that happens sometimes, yeah. you know. I mean, you're still friends with some of the people from I middle do. school. I had one very good friend from middle school. And I had a bully story as well um, that happened when I was in fifth grade. And she, you know, that's the magic of Facebook. And it's also the thing I don't like about Facebook. Anybody can find you, but anybody can find you. And my fifth grade bully friend contacted me and she was, um, it was great. She called me, we became friends. She apologized for being a bully. I'm telling you guys, stories are never over until you are dead. And even then, even not then, so much. You can't be sure Yeah, I that. can't be sure. So no, it's it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to have that. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that there's, yeah, there's all kinds of different friendships. And I would agree. Most of my friendships came from high school or older. But I am in a wedding this upcoming January. That is, I still remember a blue Hollister sweatshirt that she wore in middle school and how cool I thought she was. And I said, I want her to be my friend. And she is. <laughs> so shout out to Justina. Um, <laughs> Hi, Justina, you're cool in our book. Right? Draw Justina. <laughs> um, should we ask Caroline's question? Yeah. Go ahead. How long does it take you to write a book? It totally, totally depends on the book. Um, something like Princess and Bat Black uh, is probably, I mean, we do it off and on for so long over like sometimes six months to a year but it's probably only like two or three months of solid full-time work. And something like some of my books, my novels, I worked on off and on for seven, eight years. So it, it depends. Yeah. Oh, I mean, writing is different than illustrating. And some of my books I can illustrate very quickly, um, depending on sort of the style that you pick. Um, some of them take a long time. I think the longest I've ever spent on a book was about two and a half years. And that was between sketches and figuring out, and then doing a lot of research too. Um, the fastest I've ever turned around a book was about two weeks. That's crazy time. Yeah. When, and when we are pretty fast, we're we're, fast. For, for, for writers, compared to other writers and illustrators, we are objectively really fast. Yeah, so don't use that as a metric by any means. Not a smart idea. No. <laughs> like most illustrators, I would say, it's more common to see them do one book a year. Yeah, one or one. I think it's now more than the norm to do about two books a year, but you're kind of pushing it. I do about six or seven. I don't sleep. <laughs> she doesn't. She's just about to play. <laughs> um, so there's been some observations about the color palettes in the book. Um, and so one of the questions was, do you have a specific color palette for each character? I believe there's some noticing of like a green shirt reoccurrence. Yeah. Um, and whether that is planned or 
Yeah. So Shannon's color, I established it in the first book. And I, I think really with the first book, I was just picking complementary colors. I wanted to have a color that was devoted just to Shannon so that every time you saw her, you would know that that's the character in the book. Um, so I picked green early on for Shannon because green Shannon's eyes are sort of on the green side and her hair is red and it would look really nice with green all the time. Um, but also because it's the color of envy. It's the, you know, it's it's a, a bit of a, an agitated color. It's also the color of spring and rebirth and new hope. So I used green a lot for Shannon. And then I also started to transition her to purple because I felt like purple is a bit of a royal color and it was her moving into um, who she was eventually going to become. So the first few books, she's mostly in green, and the last few books becomes a lot more in purple. Um, but in this last book, um, and each of the characters, they always have their own color palette. So you always look at a character, and before you get a chance to recognize them, your brain already knows who they are because you've seen their color. So each of the characters sort of have that. Um, but in this particular book, um, it goes one step beyond that because she, she is she's going through um, states of anxiety and she's getting um, upset and she and the more agitated and worried and, and depressed she gets the less color I put into the images and it, it starts to phase out um, as, as the book progresses and there's just sort of a moment I finally realizing I should be looking at the camera and there's a moment where um, you know it, it goes just purely to black and white and that's when she sort of sunk on bottom um, and that's all that is really for an illustrator. It's it's challenging, but it's it's fun to do. And once you figure out, oh, that's how I'm going to get the depression through. That's like it's going to be sort of a shortcut to make sure if I can't get it in the drawings, you guys will feel it anyway. It's always the trick about graphic novels is how do we get you to feel it? Shannon was saying earlier. I think this was this was interesting. She says when you watch a movie, you notice how in the movie you have a music soundtrack and it tells you how you're supposed to feel. You don't have that in the graphic novel, so you're relying only on the illustrations. But I think things like the color and the placement and things like the frame can all tell you how you're supposed to feel just really psychologically, really subtly, a lot more subtle than you can with movie music. So it's much more yeah, subtle. I'm just trying to make music for Shane. That's what you do. <laughs> It's like yeah. we've been doing here tonight. Yeah, making man. music. Making music. <laughs> Literally <laughs> and figuratively. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, and so I think a great final question for the evening to end on is something that Claire and I talked about earlier. Um, and that is, what does it look like to be a good friend? Since this is all about friendship, what does that mean to each of you? Of It looks you know, like that. Yeah, it looks like that. <laughs> We're looking goofy together. <laughs> Oh, uh, what does it mean to be a good friend? I think that de it changes depending on your circumstance and your age. Like some ages, a good friend is just someone who you like to play with. Yeah, and that's that's enough. That can be enough at certain times. As I get older, what I look for in a friend is someone who I can relax with. Someone who we're on the same vibration and we just kind of feel each other and get each other. And we don't have to be exactly the same. But it's someone who I know is not going to judge me. I can open up my vulnerable self to them. And they're, there's going to be, like, they, they get it without me having to over-explain. Yeah. yeah. And I I really like kind people. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm finding the older we get, like, it's hard to find kind people. And people seem, as the older you get, you, you seem to find less kind. People seem to be less kind. And Shannon is honestly one of the kindest people I know. So that, that makes it very, very easy to love her for that. <laughs> Look, I hate the most I've ever made her flush. Oh my gosh! Um, and then she's just ridiculously funny, you know. And she always makes really good jokes, and she's always making me laugh. I'm hilarious. And she is hilarious, and we just and it's like I I don't know I don't know. We I, never run out of things to talk about, you know. Yeah, like it's hard to go to bed when we're together because we're like, but wait, there's something else. <laughs> so. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how you say what your best friend is or who who is a really good friend. You just know it's someone that you you, can trust you feel good with them. Oh, you feel good. I know. I think I think more. I think what something that we've done in our culture that is so detrimental is try to bury our feelings, which is like why I was hit hitting the wall with depression and friends forever in the first place is just years of trying to bury my feelings. But our feelings are like that's what makes life good. I mean, that's the whole reason for like everything that's good is feelings. There are, there are uncomfortable feelings that we get out of the idea of bad feelings. There are comfortable feelings, but they pass. We can feel compassion for them and let them pass. 
and we can also enjoy the good feelings. And 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 if we notice how we're feeling, we're going to make better decisions. And sometimes we're with people who we think with our brains that aren't always so smart that we should be with. But if we can feel how we feel with them, it's pretty clear whether those are good friends or not. That's why eighth grade is complicated. <laughs> there's so many feelings. You find out. It's all about feelings. Eighth grade, it's complicated. It is complicated. <laughs> so is 47, man. Look at that. I just hit it and got that last line in there. Woo oh, can I end with one quick story? <laughs> This is not a book because it's visual. I mean, it's it's movement based, and uh, it happened in seventh grade, not eighth grade. But when I went to my first dance, my first school dance in seventh grade, I didn't know how to dance at this kind of dance. It wasn't like a slow dance kind of thing. It was like a you know you dance in a little group. And um, my older sister Wendy from the first book, she was a really good dancer. And one time she was at home um, practicing a dance that's from Janet Jackson Rhythm Nation. And one of the movements was this. So the fists cross in front like this, and then on the way back, you grab it. And there were a lot of other things going on, but that was one thing I picked up on. And I thought, that must be how you dance. So when I went to the, it was called the stomp. When I went to the stomp, uh, we were dancing in a circle, and I'm kind of just doing a little two-step like this. And then every once in a while, I would stop and go, <laughs> but I had to stop because I wasn't coordinated enough to have my feet still moving while I did that. So I just go. And then I'm thinking, boy, people probably think I look pretty cool. <laughs> I didn't really get the idea of like complicated choreography and like maybe this isn't a really a dance per se, but I owned it and there I'm proud of it. There you go. Special, special edition story that no one else got, right? Love that. Well, and I also think it's funny for you to know that Claire and I were both underneath the table trying to do it. <laughs> you looked down at Claire we and I were both Everyone was. We know out there in Zoom land. You guys part know. part of the rhythm nation. I can't even do it fast. Well, and Claire's actually a dancer, so Claire might end up making this into a video. We'll see. Uh, Check out that Janet Jackson video. Make it big. Claire. Rip roll it for us. <laughs> I Did you know that I rip roll you guys in this book? Ooh, yeah. Ooh. I do. Okay. It's a literary rip roll. Oh, okay. I got it. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love how Liv was so confused. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah that's in there. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, well, I know this has been a much anticipated part of our evening. We're ready to close out with um, picking our prize winner for the night. Um, so people signed up for the event. Um, they're, you know, put in here. And Wynn is going to create a custom drawing for you. So let's find out who won. Claire, will you help? Beautified. <laughs> oh, I should have made us drum roll. Drum roll. It's Shirley Lee. Yay! Um, so, oh, oh my gosh, that's so funny. Yes, they're watching me. Um, no, um, I have your email address that you signed up for the event right for. So I will reach out to you, but also feel free to email me. My email is s k e e s at the novel neighbor. Dot com, and we'll make sure that we get you your custom drawing from Win. Congratulations! Um, oh, and sure. you. <laughs> that's so exciting! I am so glad. Oh, and there's so many congratulations! What a lovely group of people that are watching that are happy for. Oh, for sure. They're all doing this. They're yeah. all at home yeah. doing this. Um, I'm doing this all night. Oh my goodness! So, I sadly, I think our evening is coming to an end, which. Oh. Personally, I'm missing out on the musical element of this. So, and I feel like I know my playlist on my drive home um, <laughs> for the evening. But just one final reminder that Friends Forever came out today and you can order it from us and we will get you all kinds of goodies, um, like a signed book plate. Uh, if you're not in St. Louis, we are happy to ship to you. And I will throw up uh, where you can, um, where you can find it. Um, and any final words, uh, Shannon and Wynn? Yeah, I'd like just to say, uh, the Novel Neighbor, thank you so much for hosting us. If any of you, if you love these kinds of events and 
go to the novel neighbor. We need to support our local independent bookstores. Especially or right now. There are, not, there are not literary events like this. They do so much more for the community than most people realize. Um, they, they're integral, they are vital. And the way we support our local independent bookstores is by spending money at them. So it doesn't have to be our books, but if you make purchases in Novel Neighbor, you're helping them stay in business and keep doing events like this. So thank you so much, Novel Neighbor. Thank you, Stephanie and Claire. A material, a material girl, and, and a material material. Oh, there you go. We're, we're ending off on this, okay? Vogue. Thank you. Oh, no, Bye, everyone. Oh, oh, oh shoot. It's 90s. Oh, oh, shoot. It. I took us into the future. Next book. You sure did. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Shannon. Bye. Thank you, Thanks, Claire. Bye. <laughs>